Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today geared towards preparing your businesses for a return to the office. My name is Allison Mahoney, and I'm part of the executive leadership team here at Citroen Hygiene. Before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping items I'd like to mention. We have dedicated a portion of our time today to Q&A, and we'd love to hear from you if we haven't already. You'll notice at the bottom center of your screen a Q&A icon. Please feel free to type your questions, and we'll be sure to do our best to answer all of them by the end of our time together. We're also asking for your participation as we look to gathering some simple data points for our own use in developing our service offering. We'll be asking a few poll questions throughout the webinar and truly appreciate your participation. This will also give Dr. Chakrabarty some insight before getting into the Q&A. We maxed out on our registrants for today's webinar, but understand things happen and not all are likely to attend. So we will be recording this session and we'll send it along to all who registered along with our back to work guide. It will also be posted on YouTube and our website for your reference. As many of you know, Citroen Hygiene has been in the business of workplace hygiene for over 45 years. It would therefore come as no surprise that for the past 10 weeks, our teams have been very vested in participating in various task forces and working groups within the industry to provide our input as we evolve through this unprecedented time. As we all prepare to welcome employees back into our offices and buildings, the current situation necessitates us unwinding a decade of coming together and maximizing density through shared office space, open concept floor plans, hotel desk sharing, and requires us to put into place practices that once seemed so foreign. It's now imperative that people enter a contactless environment. Recent data shows that upwards of 70 employees in North America remain anxious and concerned about returning to work because they know their places of work are not prepared for social distancing, let alone they are remotely compliant with COVID-19 protocols. There are countless things now that us as property managers and business owners need to do to prepare for people returning to our spaces. The fact of the matter is that COVID systems in terms of social distancing and hygiene in public spaces are inadequate. So for our agenda today, we'll take you through at a high level, Citroen's Back to Work Guide. This will also be shared in its entirety after this session. It's greatly focused on limiting cross-contamination and the spread of harmful viruses and bacteria, which has always been at the forefront of our business. We will then transition to Dr. Sumantra Chakrabarti, who first joined us in late February as we were all being introduced to life with COVID-19. He will bring us the latest of updated facts on COVID-19 and give his insight on the preparations he feels prudent as we return to the office environments. Finally, Katie Baker, Citroen Director of Marketing, will moderate us through our Q&A period. Before we continue, let's try out a poll question. The poll will appear on your screen. You just need to select the answer that applies the most to you. All answers are submitted anonymously. So for our first poll question, do you feel you've done all you can to mitigate risk and reopen safely? Single choice answer yes or no. That's great. As we plan our reopenings and welcome our employees and guests back into our office spaces, it's important to realize we have one chance to make a first good impression and quell anxiety and fears as people return to the office. As of yesterday, Leger released data stating that 86% of people are concerned for a second wave of COVID-19. Having a, having a reopening plan and demonstrates your commitment to people's safety and will give your employees and customers the peace of mind they need to make your reopening successful. Citrin's Back to Work Guide was largely referenced from guides released from the WHO Center of Disease Control, the Occupational Health and Safety, as well as the Canadian Center of Occupational Health and Safety. We are uniquely positioned in reviewing these guides, realizing that much of what we do as a hygiene service provider complements the suggested protocols proposed by these leading authorities, specifically when it comes to disinfection, hand sanitizer, and particularly the contactless washroom. The guide gives you a good overview on what to consider when reopening amidst COVID-19, integrating expert opinions into your back-to-work strategy. We broke down the guide into three categories. 
operations and facility management, educational signage, and workplace practices and policies. At a high level, a few of the suggestions we've highlighted for your facility management would be ideas like removing all multi-use products from the kitchen and lunch areas. Things like coffee cups, condiments, cutlery plates, having hand sanitizer stations throughout the workplace for access by all employees and customers. For you to think about all of your high touch point services in common areas like stairway railings, elevator buttons, printers, and ensure that those areas are disinfected with a hospital grade disinfectant. A fogging type service, or one like Citroen provides with electrostatic technology is ideal for these types of services. You'll want to ensure that you have proper PPE disposal in all key areas throughout the facility and that your staff is educated on how to safely use and dispose of their PPE by placing educational posters near the disposal unit. You'll want to take a look at your washrooms and review what you have in there that is not currently a touch-free fixture. Things like faucets, flush handles, menstrual disposal units, even door openings. Many businesses are opting for shorter operating hours to ensure there is ample time for deep cleaning and disinfection. A few other ideas like dedicated entry and exit doors, removing group seating to discourage groups from congregating are also highlighted. Our next poll, do you have plans to update your washroom facilities post COVID-19? That's great, thank you. The guide also highlights much of the suggested signage for you to have throughout your facility, as well as upfront communication with your employees prior to their return so that they are prepared with what to expect. And when it comes to general practices for your business, thinking of things like staggered start and end times, enabling the ability for people to sign documents electronically, setting up virtual meeting software like what we're all using for today. Even if staff are in the same building, they can hold meetings virtually to help abide by social distancing guidelines. And a final point is the awareness that everyone is handling this pandemic differently and facing different challenges, and some may need support. A review of the support you can provide from a mental health standpoint, perhaps through an EAP if available. In our final poll, when it comes to implementing hygiene related solutions as people start heading back to work, what would you say is your number one priority? That's great. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, infectious disease specialist and CBC News contributor, Dr. Sumantra Chakrabarti. Dr. Chakrabarti is a fellow at the Royal College of Physicians of Canada and an expert in tropical medicine and hygiene. He is currently working at the front lines at Mississauga Hospital as the division head of infectious diseases and a site lead for the internal medicine clerkship. Welcome, Dr. Chakrabarti. Thank you very much for having me, guys. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. Oh, excuse me for one second, guys. Just give me a little bit of a... Right, can you see that thing yet? Screen yet? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, here we go. Let's try this now. How's that? Nope. Yep. All right, I'm just gonna press play here. Okay, so once again, thank you very much for having me. So I just wanna uh, kind of talk to you guys as a continuation. I know many of you that were there uh, at the previous one, uh, things have obviously changed quite a bit. And um, 
I want to just go over some of the more important points of things that have changed and also hopefully give you a little bit of um, reassurance is that we've learned a lot more about this virus since we last talked. And there's some things that are actually somewhat um, uh, relieving when you hear about the way that this is transmitted. So go through these more frequently asked questions. Of course, we're going to speak about the importance of uh, IPAC or infection prevention and control, including hand washing and sanitizing. And of course, at the very end, um, question and answer. So what have we learned about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 transmission since we last talked? So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, people um, uh, understandably very uh, nervous about, you know, touching surfaces, touching your face, you know, washing. I've heard about people uh, microwaving their mail, uh, Amazon boxes, you name it. And we actually have a, a lot better idea now of the way this is actually transmitted. And the best conditions for, our, for transmission are prolonged close contact in an enclosed space, okay? So the best thing that we're seeing across the um, uh, different infections we're seeing, that this is actually best happening in a household. So the bulk of transmission that we're seeing is actually not at a grocery store, not at the pharmacy, uh, you know, not when you touch a handle um, in public, but it's actually in the home transmission. And the other kind of second uh, place that we've seen a lot is in office spaces. So that's what is going to apply to a lot of you, where if you're in a place where you're sharing an office or an office space uh, that's relatively small with multiple people for hours at a time, that is a very good um, condition for transmission. Public transit is another thing that has been identified. But casual contact, again, I really want to make this clear that things like grocery shopping are very, very low risk. And this is found basically looking at multiple clusters of data that we've gotten from all over the world. Last time we talked, the bulk of the transmission was happening in China. And at that point, you're basically only looking at the most severe cases. Now we have a lot of data coming from homes, from schools, from uh, different countries all around the globe. And this is what we're seeing. The other thing that's very important is that the risk of transmission is significantly lower outdoors than it is indoors. So uh, I'm not saying that that means that we should all be, you know, going to uh, the, the park. We had, we had a big incident here in Toronto uh, in a place called Trinity Bellwoods. But what this does mean is that being outdoors, you know, is a very, very low risk as long as you're not in like a, a group of thousands of people together. Fomite transmission. So this refers to transmission off of inanimate objects. So for example, door handles, uh, desks, a phone, that type of thing. This is very, very low. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cleaning you know, high touch surfaces, but outside of the healthcare setting where you're actually outside of a person's room who has COVID, or you're in the home of somebody who has COVID, fomite transmission is felt to be a very minor um, aspect. So, uh, you know, uh, when we're talking about dis disinfecting surfaces in public, yes, I still think that should be done in uh, some of the high, uh, tra high traffic areas that we'll talk about, but this is something that can be overcome by hand washing or sanitizing. Okay. And the last thing, and I know there's going to be questions about this, regardless of what you've seen on Facebook, regardless of what you've seen in the news, the virus spreads by droplets. Okay. And this is not airborne. Um, you know, such as for measles and TB. Yes, we know that talking, coughing, all these things can produce aerosols. These aerosols are not a primary transmitter of SARS-CoV-2, SARS -CoV like they are for, ex example, tuberculosis. And we can get more into that later. So what is the best way to protect against the virus? Well, this hasn't changed actually since we last talked. Sanitizing or washing your hands is very is of primary importance. I put here the virus doesn't jump, and that's very important. So let's say you know people are worried about what happens if I touch a doorknob and I get um, you know COVID nineteen on my hands. Well, you know if you're washing or sanitizing your hands, you have now eliminated that threat. But the second thing to do is avoid touching your eyes, mouth, and nose. This is very difficult to do if you're not used to doing it like I am because I work in a healthcare setting. I am noticing a lot of people, even when they're wearing masks, constantly adjusting the mask, touching their face. Try to make it a habit to not touch your eyes, mouth, and nose unless you've washed your, or sanitized your hands. Actually, I would, you know, I would say washed your hands right before because unfortunately, even with sanitizing, Sometimes that can irritate the face. So if you do have to say, blow your nose, if you do have to get an itch, uh, get an itch on your face, 
try to wash your hands with soap and water prior to doing it, okay? The third thing is of, of obvious importance for those of us who are in Canada right now and many parts of the States is physical distancing. So if you are outside or inside, try to stay more than two meters or for our American colleagues, uh, six feet apart. And what that does is that gives um, a buffer zone. So usually when we're seeing droplets coming from somebody's nose from coughing or sneezing, they're falling to the floor within about a meter or about uh, you know, four to five feet. So if we now go about two meters or six feet apart, you're giving yourself a bit of a buffer. And the other thing, of course, with any sort of infectious disease, if you're feeling ill, you want to isolate yourself from others. You don't want to be showing up to work if you're having a sore throat. You don't want to be um, you know, uh, trying to uh, soldier through that, that uh, cough that you have. You want to stay away, especially from work. So what are some infection hotspots we should pay more attention to? So again, I'm going to preface this with that the risk of fomite transmission is low. And remember that if you do by accident touch something that may have had an infection on it, all you can do is if you wash your hands or sanitize your hands, you can take care of that threat. Okay. But the things that we should think about, especially in, let's say, an office setting, uh, is doorknobs, phone receivers, and stair banisters. So those are the things that, we, that have been identified outside of the uh, the hospital setting. For hospital setting, it is, you know, uh, the door of the, the, the person's room, the bed rails, um, faucet knobs, all those types of things. But again, outside the hospital, these things are not as important. Uh, but we just still want to be, make, make sure if you have any doubt, wash or sanitize your hands. This will take care of that threat, even if uh, uh, you have had a, um, uh, a bit of virus or bacteria picked up on your hands. What about wearing a mask? So this is something that is clearly uh, a, I want to say controversial area, but part of the reason it's controversial is because we actually don't know the best evidence for this. And I'll explain why. So uh, what we do know is that uh, even from previous outbreaks, it's cloth masks are not as effective as the hospital grade mask, but that doesn't mean that they, they don't um, have uh, some type of benefit. So the mask, what we are starting to see as the evidence mounts is that the mask is protecting more uh, the other people that are around you rather than you. Uh, and it is not a substitute for uh, hand washing, physical distancing, and avoiding touching your mouth and nose. So I don't know if you can see my, okay, no, you can't. But uh, one thing to say is that when you cough or sneeze, the droplets that come out of your mouth are large as they're close to your mouth. And then as they start to propel themselves, they get smaller and smaller, okay? The masks are good at stopping them when they're very close to your face. But as they start to disperse, um, the cloth masks don't do as good of a job. E uh, to be honest with you, either do the hospital grade masks, but the hospital grade masks do, but we are much more likely to be in contact with somebody um, who is you know, uh, vomiting, coughing, that type of thing. So that's why the, the hospital grade masks are much better for protecting the people who are working on the front lines. But in public, if you wear a mask, what you're actually doing, especially on things like of public transit, or if you're in a place where you can't uh, physically distance very easily, the cloth mask will help protect others from you. And that's why if, if lots of people are wearing them, uh, on average, that's going to be protecting the, the uh, people at large. But one thing, again, I, I cannot stress enough, this is not a substitute for hand sanitizing or washing and physical distancing. These are still, uh, they, how they were at the beginning of the outbreak, and they are now our best weapons against the virus itself. They're not very fancy, but they work. So what is the status of cases in the world right now? So when we last talked, uh, when was that? Uh, here we go, uh, around February the 24th, we had about 77,000 cases in the world total, and 99% of these were in China. You can see this map here uh, in Canada, you know, in Canada alone, we now have 80,000 cases, but this is the map now. And we're seeing that the bulk of the cases are, we are seeing the, the hottest spot in the entire world was the US. But you know, uh, that is settling down. The big hotspot in the world right now is Brazil, where we're seeing, you know, they've, uh, they're, they're in the hundreds of thousands of cases reported, but they think that they probably are now over 1.2 million uh, in terms of undetected cases. India is also looking to be a hotspot. Uh, and the other uh, ones that we saw a couple of months ago, Italy, Spain, uh, these places are all settling down, but still not out of the woods. Okay, what you can see here, 
Um, Brazil, for example, they're saying 375,000. It's probably more like 1.2 million. Um, I don't have a, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a, a small print there, but you can probably see it on your screen. If you look at these countries, uh, apart from uh, uh, con countries that are above 80,000 cases, apart from Canada and as well as um, Germany, every other country that was above these places had some type of catastrophic um, uh, area. So for example, in the United States, we all know what happened in New York City, Italy, in, in Northern Italy, Spain, Madrid was a very, very big hotspot where there were, there were uh, hospitals that were overrun. Um, Canada and Germany were, were two of the countries that didn't have this problem. We had 80,000 cases, but this was spread out over time, the so-called flattening of the curve. And because of that, we, didn't, we did see uh, lots of cases, but we didn't have an overwhelming of the hospital system. When will we see a vaccine? Well, the vaccine is something that I think we're all looking forward to, but to give a conservative estimate, I really do think that we are still several months off from this, and this is going to be uh, mid to late 2021. Uh, and the other thing that we have to remember is that when a vaccine comes, it also has to be mass produced and distributed. And that takes time as well. And that's why I think realistically to have a vaccine that's actually widely available, I'm going to say uh, more likely the end of 2021. So we are in this for quite some time yet. That doesn't mean that we're going to be in a lockdown, a full lockdown forever, but we're going to have a significant amount of disruption to our lives until this time. Um, some groups have found that the vaccines are working in small groups, in small samples. You, you have, you've heard of Moderna. Um, that was one of the companies that, was, that found a vaccine that is now, uh, look, this vaccine looks like it's working. Now we have to get safety data from this and efficacy data in uh, a much larger group. So that's being done right now. Uh, and uh, what, when, once the vaccine comes out, even if it's not 100% effective, even if it's something like 40% effective, that still kind of gives the ability for the, the outbreak transmission chain to be broken so this doesn't spread like wildfire. So you, you'll still see cases, but it won't spread as fast or as severely. And it will also give people the opportunity for the healthcare uh, networks to um, accommodate for the cases that you do see. So as the number of cases decrease, uh, what's next? So I want to bring your, um, uh, this is a article that came out in the, uh, I think it was the, was the New York Times. In any case, uh, this one was a, uh, so the so-called hammer and dance. So the initial part of the uh, wave was what we did. If you didn't do anything, you see this black curve here. You just get this exponential rise in cases to a maximum where eventually because of uh, the uh, virus not having any more hosts, it's, it burns out. But this is at the cost of lives and it's at the cost of severe overwhelming of a local healthcare system. Okay. UK tried mitigation. Uh, and the problem is they, they did it a bit too late. Mitigation is probably something you could try, but unfortunately, because it's just not enough in order to bring the, the uh, virus replication down, you, you get the same idea as, if doing no, as you are doing nothing, but it's just delayed a bit. So what's the hammer in the dance? So the hammer is basically what we did in Canada, especially is a, a widespread lockdown. And this was something that was theoretically known, but not really practiced uh, widely. The first time we saw this practiced widely was in January with, with what they did in China. So what this does, it's a hammer to try to get the transmission of the cases as low as possible so you can quickly bring down the number of cases. And then now once you're down to a very low level of cases, you do then do the dance. And what this means is you try to um, open things up you accept the fact that you're going to get some cases, but you try to keep the number of cases as low as possible. And this is done by banning large gatherings. You want to have proper testing and tracking and tracing. And when you do find small outbreaks or small fires, as I call them, you then take your public health measures and do focused isolation so you can put those fires out. Okay. And this is a kind of um, back and forth process. You do this, and then every two weeks, you're starting to uh, evaluate what's happening. Can we now lift more restrictions or should we keep them or should we, we move back? And this is something called the dance. And you do this by keeping the, ca the cases at a minimum. You keep the economy going because you, you don't want to be shutting down the economy to the point where things like food security then becomes an issue. 
all right? And then you do this until you can get a vaccine. Okay, so the hammer and the dance. So to summarize again, the dance is testing and tracing, uh, focused isolation, banning mass gatherings, and uh, putting back on restrictions when needed. This is a picture that happened in um, uh, Trinity Bellwoods Park just over the weekend in Toronto. Um, you know, this might not be the highest risk thing, but it was still 10,000 people. The risk was cut because they were outside, but they were still in close uh, contact with each other for hours and hours. And this uh, is a, a risk for infection, but not as high as if they were, for example, in a stadium together. Okay. So this is now where I will take questions and uh, comments from people. Uh, now, uh, can you guys help me again? Do I stop my share now, or are you guys going to now st share your screen? You're good, Su you're good, Suman. So um, I will uh, thank you for that information. That was really great. Uh, we do have a lot of questions that were uh, sent in previous to the webinar. So I'm just going to read through those, and if you can answer those, and then we'll get to the Q&A questions uh, that are live on the webinar. Can I make just one quick comment? I yes. do want to make uh, one uh, correction. So somebody at the last um, uh, last time we did this had asked a question about why the U.S. testing wasn't up to par. And I had thought initially at that time, well, I think that they were going to be able to ramp up. That clearly didn't happen. And it was a complicated process. But I just wanted to acknowledge that yeah, there was a huge problem with testing early on in the States. And that's now been, been dealt with. But I was wrong about that and wanted to make that correction. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Good memory too. <laughs> um, okay, so these questions come from a variety of our listeners. Uh, so the first question has to do with air purifiers. So what are your thoughts on air purifiers as they relate to COVID-19? Are they effective and will they make a difference? Air purifiers, um, you know, we've been talking about this, but in terms of uh, good evidence that they make a difference, no. But what does make a difference is you want to know that you have a minimum standard of ventilation in any room that you're in. Uh, one problem that we have been seeing in cramped quarters, uh, and especially places that have poor old ventilation systems, that can uh, increase the risk of infection. The air purifiers on their own, you know, I know that they, they um, claim to make differences with viral um, pathogens, but it hasn't shown to make any huge appreciable difference with COVID-19. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, training team members. What are your recommendations or suggestions on training new team members when the trainee and the trainer need to be in close proximity and sharing the same system? System. This is a. Uh, this is one. And, and again, I think that this is actually quite simple in terms of we know that whatever you want to do, you want to try to stay apart as much as possible, uh, two meters. Uh, if you guys, depending on what business you're in, many businesses are providing masks for their employees. So that's one thing. And remember the whole thing about, um, if, let's say if you're going to have a conversation, right? Uh, talking is one of the things, or uh, you know, not that you'd be singing in the workplace, but talking, singing, speaking at an elevated volume. These are all things that can increase the risk of transmission. So if you're going to be doing that, try to do a focused um, physical distance there, wear masks if possible, and again, wash or sanitize your hands. Um, you, you, I'm not saying to do this every minute, but try to do this regularly and that tr starts to keep um, the transmission chain short. Great. Okay, this question comes from a fitness center. So in phase one of reopening, should towel service by the organization be eliminated to protect the members? Yeah, this is a tough one. And you know, fitness centers are gonna be a, a, a difficult one because you have people that by nature are in an enclosed space, breathing hard, right, uh, be, be, be with exercise. So uh, I, I don't have a good answer to this one. Towel service is probably the least of the worries because if you have towel service, if it's a, if it's a single use towel, uh, and then you know, people are washing their hands using the towel and then they're discarding them, these are again being washed, I think the risk there is low. I think what fitness centers should be really looking at is what, the, what they're going to do in terms of having multiple people in an area. I'll give you an example, spin classes. That's gonna be tough because again, even if you do socially distance, uh, even if you socially distance in, a, in an enclosed space, if you're there for an hour, the risk is there, right? So towel service should be okay, but it's more the situation of what you do about the rooms and workout spaces and things like that. Okay, great. Um, if a case has been reported, tested positive for COVID if, of a member who has recently joined a fitness facility, what is the protocol? Sanitizing, disinfecting, et cetera? 
yeah, so the, the cleaning stuff should be the same. You know, you, you clean and you do the terminal clean. You know, usually at the end of the day, you'll see that uh, places have like a good deep clean uh, in, you know, in, in most buildings. If somebody has tested positive for um, COVID, that person should not be in public and they should be isolating at home for 14 days and uh, 48 hours after they are no longer symptomatic, whichever is longer. Okay, so that's on average about 14 days. When they come back to the gym, nothing else. So after that 14 days, there needs to be no other special precautions apart from the ones that I've already talked about. And I know I'm a broken record, guys. Mm -hmm. Washing your hands, physical distancing, and uh, avoiding touching your mouth and nose. Great. Um, okay, do you think we're moving too quickly and opening back up? It, you know, it depends on the jurisdiction. So, um, and guys, you know that I mean this with all due respect to, to my American colleagues. There are certain areas in, in the states that I'm concerned about. The answer is yes, but not all places. So, you know, for example, a place like uh, I was talking to a colleague in Iowa. Uh, there are, Iowa, the, the, you know, the number of cases in certain parts of the, of the state were low. And I think it's quite reasonable to open up. You just have to look at uh, basically the amount of transmission, the number of cases, uh, and, you know, if you have any um, ongoing outbreaks, for example, in long-term care, if a certain jurisdiction has met those criteria, it's okay to open up, but certainly that hasn't been the case all, uh, all over the place in uh, Canada and the U.S., uh, and certain places are opening up. But that said, I will say one good thing is that because we're in the summertime and lots of people are outside as opposed to being cooped up indoors, this may have an effect of decreasing the amount of transmission. It's just important for us to keep really, really looking closely and um, reacting to when we start to see spikes in cases. Great. I'm wondering if you have any ideas or suggestions for safely using a shared kitchen in a workspace. Uh, so obviously coffee stations, small appliances, fridges, dishwashers, et cetera, that staff use, yeah. should we close down the kitchen? So yeah, this actually goes with what I was saying before. Remember I was saying earlier on, fomite transmission is actually, fomite, the um, inanimate object, is not what worries me the most. What worries me the most is, is multiple people hanging out in the kitchen together for a prolonged period of time. OK, so I don't think it's at all necessary to close the kitchens, but I think that what we should do is that let's depending on the size of the kitchen, uh, if you have a massive kitchen, you, you, you want to kind of set a maximum number of people you want in there and the maximum number of, uh, amount of time they can spend there. Uh, ideally, a kitchen, you go in, you microwave your food and you leave. All right. Great. I know it's not very social, but th these are the types of new realities we have to be looking at. I am not concerned about things like coffee cups. I'm not concerned about tables as long as you're having your regular cleaning protocols and you know, people are washing their hands. Great. Can we reuse the same gloves if we have used hand sanitizer on them in between patients? Uh, uh, pa oh, patient. Uh, no, I would not do that at all. So one thing is in general is uh, in, uh, so let's start with public first. If you're in public, I would recommend against using gloves at all. People, uh, you'll notice that people are using these gloves and reusing them and they get dirty and you're touching your face. I would say just hand sanitizing or washing is the best way to go. Uh, in a healthcare setting where you are using gloves, I would absolutely uh, uh, recommend against cleaning your gloves with, let's say, um, alcohol hand sanitizer or even washing them. It doesn't, uh, the gloves weren't designed to do that. And I would say that between patients, if you're, let's say if you're working at a, I don't know, a dentist's office, you change your gloves between patients. Okay. Um, I'm just cautious of time, so we do have a bunch of more questions to get through, but I'll, we'll try and speed it up a little bit. Sure, of course. Um, so my employer is requesting my coworker work at the same desk as I, less than two feet away. Should I be concerned? Uh, yes, the, the answer is yes, and I think that uh, uh, people should be giving their workers the best chance of being um, physically distanced. Um, in, in this situation, though, if they can't do that, it's fine as long as somebody is if both of them are wearing masks. So masks it should be provided by the employer if uh, uh, social distancing is not possible. Okay. Is there a timeline that disinfectant will continue to work after contact? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure uh, about that, that question, but it's more on the, it's on the scale of, uh, of hours. Like, but that said, again, remember, because I'm not as concerned about fomite transmission, so long as the, the surfaces are being uh, cleaned relatively regularly and a good clean at the end of the day, I think that takes care of that threat. Which leads us to the uh, good next question. Is there such thing as over disinfecting common areas? 
Yeah, and I, I think that like that's not necessarily going to mean that you're going to cause something to explode. It's just that I think that it's it's more than necessary. So I think you know do, I don't think we need to be cleaning anything other than our hands more than necessary with COVID nineteen. As long as you're doing the general hygiene protocols, cleaning surfaces as you normally would, and a good clean at the end of the day, that that's fine. Okay. And I'm just going to remind everybody that a copy of uh, this recording will be sent out to everybody after the webinar. Uh, for hand washing, what type of soap is recommended? All of them work. And I think the, the, the best thing to consider is that you don't necessarily need an antibacterial soap. Any soap will, will uh, kill the virus. Just remember, try to get something that's not going to, um, if for people have sensitive skin, something that's not going to dry your hands out to the point that your skin starts cracking, because that can put you at risk for, um, you know, just other uncomfortable and, and contact dermatitis. Use a soap that works on your hands. Anyone is fine. Great. Um, what are the recommendations for reopening for cleaning uh, ventilation systems? A regular preventative maintenance, maintenance, filter changes, duct cleaning, more? Uh, this would not change based, you just go with the regular uh, recommendations for any, you know, the, in terms of building code. The only thing is that we just have to be careful with older buildings. So if you have, if you are a uh, business in an older building that your, um, your uh, HVAC and all that stuff has not been updated, then I'd recommend updating that. Apart from that, no big change. Okay. In a washroom setting, do you recommend using touchless disposable hand towels or hand dryers? Uh, I would say in this situation, in general, um, the touchless, uh, any sort of, you know, like paper towels are the best because uh, unfortunately those, those hand dryers can kind of blow things all over the place. And remember, there's other things apart from COVID, right? That we, uh, for reasons we wash our hands. But uh, uh, apart from that, something that's contactless and something that provides soap and paper towels, I think that's uh, just like before is, is uh, fine. Is UV light considered an effective solution to disinfect hard surfaces and products um, for this virus? That's a very interesting question. I think that uh, the answer to that question is not completely defined yet, but uh, yeah, we might stay tuned on this one. We might have a more definitive answer because again, we're just getting that information now. Uh, the answer I can give you today is possibly. Okay. Uh, what is the chance of becoming infected through the eyes? The chance is much lower than the um, uh, mouth and nose, but usually it comes from somebody touches something contaminated, especially in a hospital setting, and then touches your eye. It can get through your tear ducts that way, but it is felt to be much less than um, uh, the mouth and nose. Okay. Um, so the doctor stated that masks protect you from others. Does this mean that if you are wearing a mask and in close contact with someone who has not who is not and may have the virus, it could spread to you through the mask. Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Uh, let me put, let me be like, to be like, uh, you know, practical, there probably is some protection with the mask. I would say with the mask that you're wearing, it's providing more protection uh, to, from, uh, more protection to others from you rather than the other way around, but there, it probably does cut the risk. And that's the reason why it's important. If, for example, if you're in an office space, or a factory where you can't physically distance, if both people are wearing masks, that cuts the risk a lot. Okay. Um, is it true that the virus dies in hot weather in the summer, for example? No, it's not, that's not true. Um, uh, yes, hot temperatures, we're talking about 60 degrees Celsius. I, I apologize, my American friends, I don't remember the, <laughs> the Fahrenheit, but uh, that, can, you know, like what we use for sanitizing, that can kill it. But the actual weather itself doesn't seem to have an appreciable effect, but we do know being outdoors because of air currents and the way that uh, the, the virus spreads through droplets, that uh, significantly cuts the risk. Okay. Does the temperature of water used for washing hands matter? Uh, no, uh, I would say the, the main thing is you want to do it for at least 20 to 30 seconds. I've heard a fun one, uh, people singing happy birthday twice. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, rub your hands for that long on the soap. And then once that's done, you wash it underwater. But the temperature doesn't matter. Just don't burn your hands. Yeah, okay. Uh, what do you think about ozonators? Does it help with disinfecting and killing bacteria? Hmm. I know it, it, it does in certain bacterial things, but for COVID-19, I'm not certain. So I don't want to give a false answer there. Okay. Um, if a person is diagnosed with COVID, will the workplace and building they work in be contacted and advised? Uh, yes. And this, this matters hugely on your jurisdiction. But yes, in most jurisdictions, in this part of the outbreak, now that we're coming down from the peak, um, uh, rapid contact testing and tracing will be very important and focused isolation. So the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Okay. 
Uh, my question is one I would like to revisit from earlier. Can a HEPA filter help to improve and prevent droplet spread given small droplets can remain in the air for up to three hours and can also travel on dust particles? So the answer to that question is yes, a HEPA filter does that, but that's, it, it doesn't matter for COVID-19. So, um, you know, for example, for tuberculosis, where we know this is something that does, you know, hang around in the air, measles, a HEPA filter can increase the number of air circulations. So in, in that case, it does that. But so, uh, so if you are uh, in a place where you're seeing lots of TB patients and you can't get a negative pressure room, a HEPA filter is, this, is the second choice. But for COVID-19, uh, it doesn't matter because it doesn't spread in that way. Okay. Will keeping the air conditioner on increase the spread or risk of the virus? Um, it's more on the basis of ventilation. So if you ever have like, so for example, if you're in an area that has poor ventilation, you have an old air conditioning of the type that's in the window, uh, and that's kind of um, contributing to poor ventilation, the answer is yes. But air conditions are air conditioners in and of themselves, especially in a modern building, is not going to increase the risk. But being inside in an enclosed space for a prolonged period of time close together, that's what's going to increase your risk. Okay. Um, how crucial is it to have employees tested for COVID-19 before they return to work in an office environment? Actual testing, not just the antibodies. Uh, I, I would say it depends on the situation. So uh, I, I think that you don't want to be doing uh, testing um, just kind of like uh, willy-nilly of people who have no symptoms. Uh, but there are certain situations where doing regular testing uh, and the time ranges for that do vary, but in high risk settings. So for example, in long-term care facilities, in certain types of factories, uh, in the hospital, in these high risk targeted settings, doing uh, kind of uh, serial testing helps. But for a, you know, your average uh, business, your average office space, I would not recommend getting testing uh, prior to returning to work. Okay. Uh, let me see. We do have a lot of questions. I thank everyone for their questions. We are running out of time here, but I'll just ask a few more. Sure. Um, okay. So what would be the proper protocol for cleaning hotel guest rooms? Uh, you know what? The, the, again, the protocol for that would be the same as it were for uh, uh, in non-COVID times because, again, uh, like even let's say if you happen to have a COVID person that was using the bed, you would do the same thing. You know, strip the bed, clean like you would, and just remember uh, particular attention to high touch surfaces, which is what our cleaning staff do anyway. No, no difference. Okay. For janitorial staff cleaning public washrooms and areas, what PPE or additional action should they take for their own protection? Uh, in this situation, uh, you know, again, it's, it, it wouldn't be anything that's all that different, but uh, remember the, the additional thing that you would want to do is, uh, you know, uh, once you're done, you want to wash, make sure you're, you're washing your hands. And the thing is the cleaners are doing that anyway. But so for example, let's say if there's a contaminated bathroom or something like that, the way you'd wash that bathroom is going to be using cleaners and soap. It's not going to put that cleaner at any risk. Uh, it, that's different though in the hospital. The hospital is a bit of a different situation. Okay. Great. Uh, we do have a ton of questions, but unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up. So I do appreciate everybody's um, interaction and, and uh, engagement in this webinar. And thank you for Dr. Chakrabarti for answering all of our questions. Uh, I'll just ask one more follow-up question, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Um, screening around workstations and cubicles. Do you have a guideline to assist with options? Sorry, screening like, like a physical screen? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, that's one of the things. I don't know if you guys saw that video of the gym in Hong Kong where they have like a screens between um, uh, uh, between uh, treadmills. But yeah, screening is an option too. I, I, I didn't mention that before. And a physical barrier, you, you've seen plexiglass shields, but any kind of screen that can stop um, uh, particles absolutely can be a, uh, a uh, uh, an option. Uh, it's hard to do a plexiglass in all situations, but even something like that's solid enough to uh, like, like a cubicle would work as well. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. And thank you to everybody who joined the webinar. As I mentioned, we will be sending out the live recording after the webinar so that you guys have a record of it along with our back to work guide. Um, and hopefully we'll do another one of these webinars with the doctor at some point soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.